it's just so nice to be able to be completely myself in my business. I found that since becoming more in line with who I truly am, I've made much better relationships. I've met much more in tune clients. Let me ask you this seemingly simple but very powerful question. What is one of the skills that marketers know they have to improve but sometimes struggle to get right? You might have thought about 70,000 different skills that we could work on and we could get better. Well, let me tell you. Again and again and again, research shows, including LinkedIn stats, that copywriting is one of the skills that we're looking to refine. Why, you may ask? Because storytelling is everything. Storytelling brings connection, relatability, and also gets us excited about the brands that we want to connect with. I am a doubler in storytelling myself as an author of two books, as well as a writer by trade. But as always, I want to bring you the best people. And this is why today I'm grueling with powerful questions, the incredible copywriter and 20 plus years freelancer, Sarah Thousand. We start off actually by talking about her two books, The Little Book of Confusables, and survival skills for freelancers, which I own myself. As well as that, we're also going to talk about everything from national trust. And yeah, that doesn't sound like it makes sense, but bear with me, it does. As well as some books that inspired both of us, funnily enough, on how to become better writers. A couple of things that we can do that are simple but powerful when it comes to our copywriting experience. And also so much more when it comes to what does it mean to be a freelancer in the 2020s and beyond. Sarah is amazing, so I am a thousand percent sure that you are going to love this interview. I really hope you enjoy it. And as always, let us know what you think. And don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, do all the good things to support us and look out for more incredible interviews with amazing experts learning how to market to hearts, not to brains. As always, it's time now to dive deep into Sarah and her amazing books. So may today's class begin. Actually, before we, we start today, I wanted to say that so you have two books and I'm gonna let you tell us a bit like the names of them. But what I love about, uh, actually, no, I'm going to let you tell us a bit more about the books. Then I'm going to tell you what I love about them. So, yeah, can you give us a bit of a, of, a, of a spiel about the books that you wrote? And then I'll give you a little fun fact about it. Yeah, for sure. So the first one, which I wrote just before lockdown, and it launched in the thick of lockdown when everybody in the world was having to work from home, is Survival Skills for Freelancers. It's the one with the pink cover, bright bright pink cover. I wrote this because I wanted to share my 20 years of experience as a freelancer with very little support and having to work things out for myself. So yeah, it's very heart on your sleeve book. It's very much concerned, not so much with the practicalities from the how to write a business plan or how to open a business bank account, more to do with the ways we get in our own way, the stuff the mental blocks and the stuff in here, the kind of lack of confidence, uh, comparisonitis, negative self-talk, imposter syndrome, all those things that we know and love as freelancers. And then the second book, the yellow one, is The Little Book of Confusables. And this is a gorgeous book all about language. And um, it's basically 600 commonly confused words in 300 gorgeous pages all about language and the idea is that it's a fun, memorable way to remember those words that trip everybody up, even the professional writers among us. Absolutely love it. The reason why I got you to kind of lead with this, and thank you so much for giving us these gorgeous explanations and a little summaries, is first because I also realized that if you watch any of our snippets or any of our videos, your books are actually at the at the end of my little bookshelf. So if by the power of videos, you go and look at any of our <laughs> videos, maybe a snippet, you will see them little bad boys next to my little sloth. So there they are. Bitty, bitty, bitty. And um, I absolutely love the little book of confusables because I'm a linguist myself by trade. So that's what I studied at uni. And uh, obviously I studied English. I'm Italian as some of us or most of my dear listeners will remember. Uh, so English and Russian were my languages of choice. And I wow. absolutely loved um, kind, of, kind of getting into the nooks and cranny of the English language so much so that my husband every so often says, how can you correct me and my own language? And I'm like, oh, that. <laughs> that was my degree. <laughs> and um, Love it. And, so that, 
and I love that because I the book is so simple in a way that it actually taps into some of the things that a lot of people will take from granted. And I always come at this language, uh, English language, as um, a language that I had to learn consciously. You know, you mm. don't kind of come to it and just kind of things make sense. I learned the grammar. Uh, Italian is very structured as grammar, so we kind of start with their premise with anything else that we learn, especially language-wise. And so for me, this is also the book that I wish I had as I was getting more into the day-to-day -day of um, of kind of speaking English and living in the UK. And that's why I love it so much because I'm just like, every so often I just kind of send it to my husband and be like, baby, this is the reason why this is the right word and not this word. <laughs> and then I you kind it. of see and do like, a, like hmm. so it's honestly a great asset for anybody. Now, I'll take that. We know <laughs> we know <laughs> something already about your work, Sarah, but I got one more question to ask, you know, that we started leading with some writing, which we know is going to be something we're going to talk about and freelancing, which also we're mm. going to be talking about. But what is something that people that already know who Sarah is would be surprised to learn about you? Anything? Let's go with anything. Let's let's open the realms of possibilities. <laughs> I am an obsessive birder. I am absolutely obsessed with birds. There is nothing I would rather do at the weekend. It's not partying, clubbing. Those days are over. I love going out with my binoculars. I've got a camera with a big long lens. I love taking photos, trying to spot the rare birds that no one else has seen. That's my happy place. I love being out in nature. I always have. I absolutely love that. Now the second question comes as a hand. How did this passion come about is it something that came out of something or is it more you've always been there something you've always been interested in you talked about you love nature but I kind of wonder yeah it's it's interesting because I used to be well I just I've always been nerdy my whole life but I went through a big chunk of my life where I thought it's not okay to be nerdy so I masked not being nerdy and now at the age of 53 my inner nerd is creeping out and I'm just embracing it because it's just so nice to be able to be completely myself in my business I found that since becoming more in line with who I truly am I've made much better relationships I've met much more in in tune clients and they're all a better fit but yeah I was really nerdy and into nature and birds specifically when I was younger I remember going to this shop when I was a really little girl I think my mum said I was about four there was this magical shop in this village that was quite nearby where we lived and the guy had a golden bird cage on the um on the counter but not with real birds in with mechanical birds and I was fascinated with these mechanical birds. And I remember him giving me Smarties out of this big goldfish bowl on the counter of the shop. And he had this giant poster on the wall that was all the birds of Britain. And my mum said I stood there and went, Chaffinch, Robin, Blue Tit, and I was four. So I don't know where it came from, but there was definitely a long period in my life where I felt it's probably not that acceptable to be a young woman and be massively into birding so I did kind of hide it and then I think with lockdown I think when we everything just kind of got simple again and got back to basics and that appreciation of the, the outdoors and fresh air and nature and birds just really came back to me and I've just indulged it ever since <laughs> I've only been with my partner five years and he always says you weren't quite this into birding when we first got together <laughs> I know that you know of my dear <laughs> but you know what I love what you mentioned there I love that you also brought it back to business because I'm thinking about obviously a lot of what what you do especially obviously you know when it comes to the communication and the writing and the copywriting and that space yeah. As communicators, I find that uh, doing, we had another amazing conversation with a copywriter, uh, Robin Lee Evans. And one of the things that she mentioned as well is kind of, you know, copy that speaks from the heart. And in that respect, I think a lot of it is easier to come when you also start like rekindling with who you are. So I love that mm -hmm. it brings obviously so many good benefits on a business perspective, but even more so as a communication perspective. Because um, I think one of the reasons why You'll be glad to know, and I'm pretty sure you already know, but like copywriting is one of the most um, sought after skills in 2023 for marketers, but I generally could say for anyone that is kind of in the digital space. 
mm-hmm. is because we realize that you know communication is so important and i think as you said a lot of us realized that we had to communicate online a lot more in the past couple of years yeah. and i kind of find that some of us might have a disconnect not personally myself i started as a writer i want always wanted to be a writer so in my head i wanted to write how i spoke because it felt natural to me yeah. but i know that it can be a lot of a challenge for a lot of people you know when it comes to that rekindling with who they are and then from that also thinking about bridging the gap between how they want to be perceived but also you know how they want the personality to show up in written form which is not mm-hmm. easy for a mm-hmm. lot of us no. and that's how I see it at least I would love to hear your opinion on this because I think it's definitely something that I've seen a lot of a lot of people a lot of professionals trying to get their grips with and also trying to get more confident with have you found that any of your clients has oh. this you know, this gap that they're trying to bridge. Yeah, there's there's such a lot to unpack there. There's such a lot I could say in response to, to that um, that you've just said. I think one thing that's really worth mentioning is that a lot of professional writers become so used to writing on behalf of their clients. So we're creating tones of voice that fit our clients' businesses. And we become so used to writing in these other tones of voice that when we come to sit down and write as ourselves, we have lost track of that voice and who we really are and how we really sound when we're writing. And um, yeah, I think that's a really big issue. So I think one thing that I would recommend if professional writers out there are finding this issue is to just remember to do some writing for you or for your business. If you aren't already blogging, Blogging is a brilliant thing to do to just, as copywriters, you know, I I find and my community find that by blogging, we are showcasing, we're not just showing what we know about the subject we're blogging about, but we're showcasing our writing skills. When I first started as a copywriter, I found that I would do a lot of work that was more corporate. I had a corporate background. I worked in financial services, but the corporate tone of voice was a million miles away from my natural tone of voice. These days, I generally tend to attract clients who want a conversational copywriter, who want someone who is a big advocate for human language and natural writing that follows the way we speak. Obviously, a lot more articulate than how I am when I speak because I'm quite ADHD brained. I, I, My brain is firing off at a million miles an hour. And if I stay on track with every question you ask today, I deserve a medal because it never happens, just to warn you. But there's another sort of side benefit that I think is really worth mentioning because it's something that's only occurred to me fairly recently. And that is now that I am being more authentically myself in my writing, but also in every way that I liaise with other people and build relationships and nurture those connections in my business life, I've actually found through that that it has a really positive impact on imposter syndrome. And the reason being, a lot of imposter syndrome is concerned with that feeling that we're kind of up on a certain level. We're being the professional, we're writing professional, we're dressing professional. And all these perceptions and all these, I guess, cliches of what professional actually means. Whereas... In reality, every business interaction is human to human. I fully believe that we're not business to business or business to consumer. We are all human to human because whatever you're writing, your words aren't being read by boards of directors. They're not being read by departments. They're not being read by teams or brands. They're being read by individuals, by humans. So if you can keep the way you write really nice and close to who you feel you actually are underneath. Not only will you attract more of the clients who are the perfect fit with your business and where you want your business to go and the goals for how you see, you know, where you see yourself in five years time or whatever, but it does mean that there is less of a a margin for imposter syndrome because that fear of, oh, I'm going to get found out I'm being something that I'm not, it gets taken away because it's no longer founded. You're not pretending to be something you're not. You are being authentically yourself. And 
What was amazing to me, again, a bit of a tangent, but I think it's worth mentioning. I went to a business event quite recently, not as formal as a conference, but that sort of thing, that sort of scale. And I met some amazing women on that day. Some decent guys as well, but (laughs) the biggest connections were with these amazing women. And I realized that what we talked about hadn't been work related. It had been menopause weight gain. It had been Marvel movies we'd been watching. It was anime. It was all my nerdy stuff. And I've made really great connections through this event through letting out those chinks of who you really are. I think that's really important and a really nice thing for people in business, particularly those who are starting out, a really nice, empowering, just a lovely realization. I love all of that. And one of the things I even wrote it down, like typing away quietly, was, you know, like the fact that all business, all writing is human to human. And I think it's that reminder of that, which... We still forget when you say writing for corporate, as you said, yeah, mm. but we're still, it's still that human on the other end of the spectrum. Exactly. And I think is understanding how to deliver the, the message in a way that resonates with them. And I'm going to say one thing on, um, on just the, the topic of actually the tone of voice, which I kind of thinking about, especially professional and corporate. I find that sometimes we can easily go the other way around where we're trying to be almost too conversational. Mm. And then again, from from a writer perspective, I'm just putting a little writing hat on. So a reminder for anybody who's like, yeah, so I can be conversational. Yes, a thousand percent. But especially when you're writing to define the value of something or, you know, how something can provide support and, and, and a transformation. Still remember that sometimes simpler is better. And um, because I've noticed then there's the other other way around of the wave of trying to write in a way that feels like somebody's talking to you. But then, you know, if it's a product or if it's a service, I still don't have any idea at the end of all the reading, mm. what the hell am I going to get myself into? Mm. So I just wanted to mention that to kind of on that first point. And then on the second point and those little tangents along the way, I still think it's important to talk about them. So thank you for actually mentioning them because it's that, is the uniqueness of tapping into our, you know, birding, uh, marvel, loving little quirks, you know? Uh, sadly, I can't relate with birding, but I can relate with marmor loving. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and um, since I started talking about my love for band t-shirts, every so often somebody kind of writes to me, well, like listeners or like audiences and be like, you know, how many have you got? Have you got a new one? Or, you know, I show the ones that my friends gifted me. And so it has become a bit of an association with who I am. And Jeremy Hens, who was on the podcast last season, talked a lot about this, about how these little connections of the things that we love help others also find a way in Mm. and the other way around so i think there's so much power in that so thank you so much for mentioning that because i think it's so important Mm. you gave us a couple of lessons already which i'm really happy there's a couple of things from like obviously blogging for yourself and you know kind of putting into your creative outlet but i'm going to push us again and this is going to be focused and structured so careful careful everybody is the one thing is the one thing that you can teach us but is in a minute or less. So if you were to teach one thing, Sarah, to our students and our listeners in one minute or less, what would that be? One thing that we can take away? Okay, so I haven't timed myself on this, but it comes back to what you've said about writing should always be as simple as possible. And one of the ways to make sure that your message hits home, it has impact, is to take out the filler words Because a lot of writing that we see in a business capacity on LinkedIn posts, whatever, is bloated and and, and too wordy and stuffed with, yeah, just stuff that doesn't need to be there. So go through your writing, the next email you write, the next social post you write, the next blog you write, and take out these four words as a starter, okay? That really just and very and if I've got a couple of seconds left to elaborate I'm going to give an example okay so here's from a real life email I just thought that I would write to suggest that we meet up another filler to discuss the project further another filler so five filler words in a sentence of that length if you can take out those filler words if you've intentionally used one of those words and 
you think it doesn't sound better without it. Great. Okay. This is more about trying to be intentional with your writing and really taking the time to think, does this word justify its position in what I've just written? Does it deserve to be there? Or is it just filling a purpose of stuffing and increasing my word count? Let's dance again. And uh, listeners, I've seen my little <laughs> dance. Sarah's dancing too. So this is a happy <laughs> dance because you know what, Sarah? This was probably, adverbs, <laughs> filler words, the <laughs> biggest lesson that I learned from on writing, my favorite book. But, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm biased. Every book, the book every writer should read, but it's because I love Stephen King. So fine. But, it taught me so much. Obviously, I, was, I wanted to write fiction at the time, so that's why I read it. But then I realized that it taught me so much about writing also nonfiction. So on writing mm. by Stephen King, the only book that is not, you know, there's more about his journey as a writer than anything else. And he goes on about filler words. He goes on about adverbs. He goes on about all these things. And obviously from a fictional perspective, and it's interesting because as a fiction writer, it still can get very vivid uh, examples and images of the mm. journey like you can see what the protagonist is feeling and the whole experience but it still is as you say very careful about the purpose of their words and that was probably the thing that he banged on about the most mm. um you know that that attention i love that you re reflected that onto our business perspective also with some filler words that i can definitely see actually as well as another one there <laughs> kind so of it's it. another Exactly. Starting a sentence and with so, often oh. not needed. It's interesting, oh. though, that you mentioned on writing by Stephen King, because I was going to mention that later, so maybe I'll come on to that. It's one of my favourites as well. Part, part See, memoir, part manual, I would say. Exactly. Look at us, little queens geeking about writing. I love this already. I'm really happy now. <laughs> um, it's generally one of my favourite books. Um, and I have a book in English and in Italian, everybody, because that's that's how early I wanted to learn the wow. wisdom. But not. And um, you know what? One more thing I'm going to say about this uh, is that also this great advice, you can then trans uh, translate it into, first of all, any type of writing, even when you're working with clients. I find that similar to the example of the email. Sometimes we add too much where, you know, kind of simplicity helps for everybody. Yes. But also it can help you be more intentional with your speaking, which can also be a hard thing. And I think it's just... Uh, is that awareness? I just adjust. But it's that awareness that we can bring into the space and allows us to practice and then recognize these things, which I absolutely love. Now, I'm going to look at somebody or something, sorry, that you learned from somebody else. So we looked at some of the things that you know and something that I love how you also kind of give us this piece of advice. But what about frameworks or strategies or even a tactic that you learned from somebody else that really stood out to you, Sarah? What would that be if you were to think right. about one? Well, I have a, a brilliant memory for things that I shouldn't remember and a terrible memory for things that I should. So I had to go with something that I learned really recently uh, and I thought this was impactful for me. So because of the way my brain is wired, neurodiversity or whatever it is, I find it very difficult to goal set in the traditional sense. So if you said to me, where do you see yourself in five years time? I have no idea. I'm not somebody that has ever spent a lot of time planning. How did I write two books in six months each? I went with the energy. That's my strategy. I go with the energy. So if I have an idea and the energy is not with me, I'll know it because I'll start feeling resistance. But that's just background. But the other day, I read something or I heard it on a podcast, or I read it and then I heard it on a podcast and I thought somebody's trying to tell me something. And it was about the difference between outcome goals and process goals. And for me, the outcome goal is the bit that, okay, I say, you know, oh, I want to write a book. It, in terms of your listeners, it might be, I want to become a better writer. And um, that's the outcome. But that's quite difficult to measure. So what you need to do is have all these little steps along the way. And if you're not that great, like me, at breaking down those steps into bite-sized chunks. What is a really good way of, of doing it is setting a number of process goals, which are the ways, the little tiny micro steps of things that you can do every single day, that if you do those things every single day, the outcome is likely to happen for itself. So it's almost as if you don't want to forget about the outcome altogether, but it's there in the back of your mind. But instead of going, oh, you know, in six months time, I'm going to have become a better writer. As you know, because you've just shouted out this very book, in Stephen King's On Writing, he says, 
if you want to become a better writer, you have to do two things above all else. Write a lot and read a lot. So if anybody wanted to become a better writer within six months time, two of the process goals that they could set for themselves are, for example, I will read for 30 minutes a day, every day. Doesn't matter what it is. Take examples from different styles, from fiction, from non-fiction, from biographies, whatever kind of style you like, but kind of stretch yourself and start reading different things. So that's one of the process goals. Read for 30 minutes every day. And another process goal might be, I will journal for 20 minutes every day. So that's practicing your own, and you had no idea when you asked me that question earlier, but just how well that would tie in with finding your own voice if you journal for a certain amount of time every day. And then do that for six months and then see where you are. You'll notice that you've made significant progress. And for me, having those process goals, that's something that my brain can get behind. The outcome goals, not so much. They feel fairly nebulous. Hopefully that will help other people. Big fan of process and outcome goals as a concept. I find that when, when I wrote my second book, right after that, the book came out during the pandemic in 2021 and I was trying to explain how to balance our goal setting better, especially with the idea of reclaiming time. And I came up with the idea of micro goals, not realizing that literally micro goals are like process goals. Okay. Uh, be because I found that exactly what you said, you know, there is this issue for us sometimes to see the bigger picture and also to find that momentum, depending on who you are and obviously, you know, your brain and how you best work. If we're constantly kind of looking for big goals that feel very unattainable, whereas doing something repeatedly for a certain amount of time, if it's tied to a bigger goal or a bigger outcome, feels a lot easier and also a lot more rewarding. And at the end of the day, I always believe that success can only be built when we create success for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we have to create an environment where we win <laughs> as much as possible. Absolutely. Not always possible. You know, when it's possible, we might as well. Mm. So I, I, I love that you mentioned that because it generally it's something that so many of us struggle with, especially you talked about, you know, imposter syndrome earlier. So we compare ourselves to what we see from others and the goals they achieve. Mm. And it's kind of hard for us to relate because we don't know all the steps. And in this way, we're also reminding that there is the micro steps we can take can get us there too. And yeah. again, you asked to read it more, which is yeah. in itself, you know, a great practice too. Talking about practice, I want to do a bit of a, a quick side jump on tools. Is there any tool that you love when it comes to your day-to-day -day work? If you were to find or think about, sorry, one tool, one tool that you love when it comes to your day-to-day -day work as a writer or copywriter or even freelancer, what would it be? It's really difficult for me to choose. There are three that stand out. One of them is Canva, obviously for social media content, content even. But I use um, Canva for things like um, my info pack. So if a client wants to have a discovery call with me, I will just eliminate the tire kickers, send out my info pack. This is my approach. This is my terms. And uh, this is an example of my prices. So that's a real good productivity hack for me. And it looks great because I've designed it in Canva. Another thing that I use day to day is Calendly um, for scheduling meetings. That saves a lot of time. But the thing that I think I couldn't do without is text replacement. And I use it on my phone. So I probably have thousand shortcuts programmed into my phone. Everybody, I imagine, knows how to do that. But I don't think many people use it to its fullest extent. And so I have, say, a number of specific responses that I use on social media and I can just access them with just a couple of keys on my phone. On my laptop, I use a Mac and I use a piece of software that's called Text Expander. Now, I've used it for about five years and I literally have everything. So, for example, when somebody says to me, can you send me a 50 word bio? Can you, um, I have things like my national trust membership number, my passport number, important phone numbers, entire emails. So if I get a cold inquiry that's related to copywriting, I'll have literally cold ink CW and I will type that code, the entire email will paste into a brand new email, and then I'll go through and tweak it just to make it specific for that inquiry. So that is my biggest time saver slash productivity hack, text expander. Woohoo! Yeah, <laughs> and it ties in with templates, which i uh, big fan of. I find that 
and not everybody interestingly enough but a, a larger population sorry a larger percentage of people that at least have had conversations around this we seem to I'm, I'm in the category too to work better when we have something to work from and then make mm-hmm. it ours instead of creating it from scratch yes. so the te- these kind of templates and these these shortcuts really help with that uh, but I also kind of love that your national trust number is also in there just <laughs> <laughs> just, just kind of like, you never just know when you might emergency need your nat- national trust number <laughs> for a little we can get away if you're not in the uk uh with national trust you can go in all these beautiful properties and parks and places and i'm a member too so it, it's a really nice place if you like nature High five little little, little tip number. there thank you national trust you're not sponsoring us but if you ever want to <laughs> final question from class in session is about lessons that we have unlearned so we're going to go the other way around now and just close off with something that maybe you have unlearned recently. It can be anything that has improved either the quality of your life or your work. So we'd love to hear what's something that you have unlearned recently, Sarah. The thing that I thought of that might be useful is it is actually going back a couple of years. And it's when I first wrote Survival Skills for Freelancers. I wrote that book to help people. No hidden agenda, no doing the whole Daniel Priestley key person of influence thing because I didn't read that until three years after. But what happened as a result of writing a book that was genuinely intended to help people, I think people picked up on that and the fact that it is so value packed and and so genuine, not like quite clearly one of these books that people have just written a book to get the position as a thought leader in their field or whatever. All these opportunities started opening up and one of them is guesting on podcasts, things like this. I've done 65 in just over three years, which is quite a lot. And I started getting invitations to, I became a mentor for the Freelance Hair 100 scheme. I became a mentor for the government's Help to Grow scheme, all things that I never set out to do. And I kind of got swept up in this this is a big thing for me, the whole shiny object syndrome. It's It reminds me of that meme, I have a te- uh, ADOS, attention deficit. Ooh, shiny. <laughs> um, so for me, I was getting a lot of the ooh, shiny. And I started doing these things and I started letting other people's expectations get inside my head. And it wasn't good for me. So I'd have people saying, oh, you should um, create an online course so you can make money from your expertise. You should um, create a monetized Facebook group. Well, I hate Facebook for, for starters. That's not going to happen. I, I, I'm a copywriter and I really lost sight of the fact that the thing that I love doing in my career, above all else, is writing and taking other people's terrible copy and making it shine. So doing that transformation, that is my happy place. That is my superpower. And I really lost sight of it because I was listening to what other people thought I should do. And I got so caught up in the shoulds. So it took me, I'd say about a year of following other people's expectations before I thought, what am I doing? And I would get clients getting in touch with me and saying, wow, it's amazing what you've achieved with your book and you're doing all this training and mentoring and all this. Are you still doing copywriting? And copywriting was the only thing that was really making me money. And I had taken my eye off the ball. So focus your attention on what's in here like what really lights you up what do you love doing what do you get the most fulfillment from and the most sense of achievement and happiness and contentment because work and running your own business particularly it's not all about making money it's not I I don't believe in the whole six-figure hustle I don't think it's all about that there are so many different ways of measuring success and If you stick to your guns and listen to your gut, try saying that aloud, fast, drunk, and um, you just, you can't go far wrong if you listen to your gut and if you continue to do the thing that lights you up. Excellent reminder. Excellent reminder, especially as we're growing. That's, That's the thing, especially as, as you say, when more opportunities come and fun fact, this is most likely one of the biggest things that most guests have told me that they've been unlearning most recently when we talked. 
So really? in different varieties, in different ways, like in different aspects, whether it's saying no more, whether it's prioritizing better, our focus. I think you come to a point where I was listening to Jay Klaus, yet another podcast. I like how just like name dropping podcast guests today, but uh, Jay is amazing. And I was listening to um, a podcast that he did with somebody else. And he was talking about how we go from, you know, t- trading, obviously money, sorry, time for money. And then mm. at some point you get to that point where you grow enough that you feel comfortable, you know, paying money at all. Let's put it this way, outsource or delegate if you want to grow because that's what you want to do because you realize that at some point your time is so valuable that it's the currency that you really want to protect as much as obviously you want to grow and make profit so I think Mm -hmm. it's an interesting different way of thinking some people have different priorities but when you really start prioritizing your time you realize that is a be more mindful of what you say yes to and then if you really want to grow and you really want to expand that it maybe is asking for help or streamlining Mm. in my opinion these are the two Mm. so Mm. I love that you mentioned that because I think it's um it's something that so many of us will go through at different stages and then you kind of feel you're over it and then shiny objects come back and you're like and then you relearn or unlearn it it's interesting as well like with with the first chapter of survival skills for freelancers being if you try to do everything yourself for your business it's the fast train to burn out because it is so the the whole idea of outsourcing i'm so behind that it's really important class was in session but now it's time to quick fire sounds very ominous and i like to use it and then it actually is a lot more vanilla but it's fun as she says i'm gonna give us two options Sarah, okay. and you can keep one. We ready? Yep. Spotify playlist or podcast? Spotify playlist, all day long. Yes. Uh, voice notes or texts? Voice notes. Mm, interesting. Easy. Carousels? <laughs> <laughs> no time to waste. Uh, carousels or reels? Reels. I barely ever do carousels. I probably should, but I don't. TikTok or YouTube? Um, YouTube. So if you were, I'm going to get back to the last one then. If, you, uh, if you're going to wear the hat to the consumer, so would you still say that you would rather consume reels than carousels? Or is it kind of more like you would not necessarily create them for yourself, but you don't mind? Um, yeah, I'd rather consume reels. I feel like I'm such a visual person and I get that carousels are also visual, but carousels tend to be a bit more wordy and as well as writing for a living, that kind of means that I also read for a living. So for me, moving pictures, mm. it's 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 easier, it's less taxing on my brain, and it's a good way of me absorbing information. I love that. I, I do resonate with that a lot. It's one of those things is that like, and I think it's changing the narrative, just a little aside, and we'll jump back on, uh, of you know what we should do, because obviously it performs well, or people mm. kind of like to consume it as well, but also what we like to create and what we like to consume ourselves uh, makes whatever we're creating a lot more enjoyable. That's how mm. I find it. Mm. Two more. Newsletter or Twitter? To consume or to produce? Oh, good question. Uh, let's do both again. Go on. Oh, okay, so I do both. So I would say to consume probably Twitter just because I'm so busy. I always feel I don't really have time to read other people's newsletters. And to put out Twitter because it's just so much easier <laughs> and and that's another thing that I do with the energy so I will have little droughts on Twitter where I won't post anything for a couple of days I do have some automated tweets that go out in a funnel and that's great but me being on Twitter posting random stuff is is very much behind my energy so sometimes I'll post 10 tweets in a day but other days I won't post anything that, that I find is like our version of consistency, our version of flow. That's what I like to call it as well, because then it feels less. I think consistency has such a, it's such a, a heavy weighted word these days. Yeah. You kind of have expectations yeah, yeah. around it. So it's almost like finding your flow and it kind of gives you freedom to have the flow that you want. So mm-hmm. I love that. Now, this is the most important because it's the last one. And there is no judgment from myself or the listeners, depending on which one you'll choose. Yikes. But there's there might be some pressure there. I'm just <laughs> bigging it up again. Memes or GIFs? Memes. And I think that's because I'm a language lover. So a lot of the memes around language are just brilliant. And there aren't so many GIFs around language. So the stuff that, that I, I have a very strange sense of humour, but the stuff that makes me laugh is all, it's always language related. And it's always those like, yeah, 
memey things. Plus, the memes can be turned into puns. So you know, like language memes can be turned into <laughs> puns, which I think is an excellency. She knows. You know, I know what you're talking about. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Um, I got a few more questions to close us off. The first one is: Do you remember Sarah? The last picture that you took on your phone. What was it? I don't know, but I got forty thousand photos on my phone, so I take a lot of photos. Um, the last photo I took on my phone, I can validate it. I think it was because I just had a big reorganization of my garden. I just moved everything around and I took a picture of it to send my daughter. Celebrate. <laughs> Celebrate the hard work. Uh, you talked about Twitter and we also mentioned on the platforms, but I'm wondering what is your favorite social media platform at the moment and why? Oh God, it's been Instagram for so long, but Instagram has gone through the floor lately. I don't even know why I'm bothering with Instagram. So I'm going to say um, LinkedIn. And who should we follow on LinkedIn if we were to choose Me. one person? To... <laughs> and another one? <laughs> you. Touché. By the way, um, John Aspirin is great. He is like the LinkedIn guru hate that word but he there's nothing that guy doesn't know about um about linkedin he's very approachable he's always he um has this trademark relentlessly helpful and if there's anything you ever want to know about linkedin he's the guy love that and finally if you could broadcast one message onto everyone's phone what would that message be what (laughs) um oh yes you really do need the little book of confusables I genuinely think so many people. Do you know Tom Reed Wilson from Celebs Go Dating on TV? He did a video post on his Instagram about this book, about Little Book of Confusables. So there's so many people who've gone, oh my God, I didn't think I needed this book, but I read it and then it's brilliant and you have to have it and you wonder how you manage without it. So yeah, that's a bit of a cop out because I had no idea that that question was coming. (laughs) I'll think of something amazing later and I'll be like, damn. I know. We are evil. Anyways, thank you for joining us. I want to say, though, thank you so much for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure having you. And it was so nice to kind of cover all these wonderful things. And again, kind of also, I think, help us uh, sometimes getting out of our own way, both on the writing perspective and also on our goals and how we see ourselves and our growth so Mm. thank you so much sarah if people want to find out more about you where should they go go to my website it's sarahtownsendeditorial.co.uk and you can sign up to my newsletter connect with me on social media find out more about my books everything's there thank you so much team once again for being here as always we'll be back next week with more wisdom marketing roundups and all the good things about how to market to hearts but in the meantime class dismissed.